Shall we get started? Hi, my name is Matthew Saunders. Uh, I work for a, an agency in Denver, Colorado called Atten Design Group. I'm the Vice President of Project Management there. Um, and uh, uh, feel free to, to reach out to me on, on Twitter or Google Plus or IRC or whatnot. Um, I'm happy to, happy to share and talk and, uh, and, uh, and spend time with anybody that uh, is interested in talking about process. I'm also uh, an at-large uh, uh, Drupal Association board member, um, so if, uh, if there are th issues that you want to uh, reach out to me about in terms of uh, uh, the con or, or, uh, or things that the association is, uh, is engaged in, um, I'm one of the people that, uh, that was elected, uh, uh, I guess I, it's about a year and nine months now, uh, and I'm very, very happy to chat with you about uh, any issues that you might have, any questions that you've got. Um, I'll make sure that my slides are available uh, at some point or another, probably on, uh, on the uh, DrupalCon website. Um, and uh, so if you, if you want to grab those, you can as well. I've been working with open source professionally since about 1997, um, and I've been working with, uh, with Drupal uh, since 2006. Started uh, working with Drupal in version 4.6. Did a very, very short stint uh, in 4.6, um, built a bunch of sites in 4.7, um, and, uh, and I haven't really looked back since. Um, the company that I work for at Design Group is focused on working with companies that do good in the world. Our core values include a strong desire to affect positive change in the world. To this end, we've been working with companies like Pointer, World Resources International, the World Bank, Stanford University, Results for Development Institute, Knowledge for Health, Human Rights Watch, those kinds of, uh, of, uh, of groups. Um, let's see. So what I'm going to start with is talk a little bit about a book called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Is, has, has anybody here read that book? Just one. Okay, you're not allowed to answer any questions. Um, it's a great book, really worth, uh, worth reading. It, uh, it, talks about, uh, it talks about how um, there are outliers of stats and, uh, and, uh, those, and how those stats uh, uh, sort of fold into into, into systems. And one of the things that he talks about in the, in the book is that a number of commercial flights started crashing in the 90s, and nobody could really figure out why that was happening. There wasn't anything that had uh, anything to do with uh, mechanical failures. There wasn't uh, icing happening on the wings. Nobody could figure out what the heck was going on. So I want you to think about that. I want you to keep that in your mind while we go through the presentation, because at the end, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to it, and uh, we'll touch on why that's important in terms of, uh, of project management and how that uh, relates to Agile. So we need project management for su successful outcomes. Um, to illustrate that, I put out a call for stories on my blog, on Twitter, on Facebook, and uh, asked people to, to, to send me their horror stories, basically. And I got about 40 responses altogether. Um, and uh, they range from complaints about support for modules to, uh, to why the heck uh, isn't there uh, uh, documentation that uh, makes sense on Drupal.org to client stories. And what I grabbed was three gems, three stories uh, from, from folks that, uh, that uh, uh, sent, me, sent me notes about their, their, uh, their project management uh, uh, horror stories. So the first is, a couple of months ago, I got a call at 6.30 in the morning. My client was yelling and screaming at me because my site had gone down. I drag myself out of bed, get to the computer, and his site comes right up. I told him to try, try to go to, to Google, and guess what? According to him, Google was down too. So I politely asked him to call his internet provider because that was, was what was down, and once the internet came back up, to use it to search for a new developer. So this is sadly pretty common, and, and, it, and it illustrates a lack of empathy between clients and, uh, and, uh, and vendors. And it's really important for us, really at the very beginning of, our, of, a, of an engagement with a, with a client, to talk to them, set, set expectations. Because in this case, I'm nearly sure that that uh, vendor hadn't set the expectation that he wasn't a 24-7, 365 days a year vendor, right? 
he was just a single guy trying to do good work and uh, and ended up getting pissed off because uh, because uh, uh, his uh, his his uh, his client called him early in the morning. We need to be active listeners. Number two, I had a project. It had multiple decision makers, and they wouldn't move forward unless they agreed on any one point. And they couldn't agree on anything. How many of you have been involved in projects where, where decisions were made by your, uh, by your client through, uh, through a committee? It sucks, right? It's terrible. It's the worst possible way that you can, you can engage in a, in a project. So, again, right at the beginning, I think what you need to do is set up a situation where the client is really clear I need one point of contact or two at most, maybe a backup, and that person needs to be uh, needs to be able to make decisions on behalf of the organization that you're you're uh, you're working for at that point. Indecision is crippling, and it can cause projects to go way over budget simply by eating up time um, in in uh, in uh, in weekly meetings with the client where where actual no work isn't actually getting done. All right. The third story. I had a client who didn't know what they wanted. They spent hours in meetings throwing ideas around. And then despite warnings that they were consuming all of their contracted hours, they insist that they shouldn't have to pay for for the time because the site hadn't been built. How many of you have had that happen? Yeah. So again, this comes back to process. It comes back to setting up schedules, expectations for both client and vendor, and it speaks to a lack of of, uh, planning, communication, process, focus, and differences in culture. And these differences in culture can make for very bad outcomes. Our clients are content uh, content experts in their field, but they don't necessarily understand things like block, variable, theme, bean, context. All these words mean things that are completely different to them. So we have to become translators. We need to have mutually understood vocabulary. So they understand when you're talking about a bean, you're not talking about a can that you're getting from the grocery store. Project managers are those translators, and and, and, uh, and Agile can help bridge the gap um, in terms of understanding by breaking projects up into smaller, bite-sized pieces that make sense, that are understandable. So what you're looking for is a paradise of concordance. I find it funny, actually, that there's bird poop on paradise up there. Um, and you desire understanding, but you can find yourself trapped in an emotional state when you assume that a client where rather a client assumes that something is easy or it won't take much time, but that's never true. You can find yourself in a place where you wonder whether you'll ever get the chance to build something, and you can find yourself in a place where your project is in constant flux, changes the norm, and predictability is gone. And at that point, you panic. Don't panic. You don't need to panic. Our job is to communicate. It's to translate. It's to mediate. It's to unblock Our job is to bring calm from chaos. And above all, our job is to make everybody else's jobs easier. We are there to simplify the complex. And if we're being successful, people might say, why on earth do we have project managers? Don't be fooled by that. We're the cat herder, but not of just developers and themers, but of also product owners, business owners, and clients. We keep the communication running. We keep all the ducks in a row, and above all else, we have to help our teams avoid shiny things. Like these birds, you know, they'll they'll fly around, and they find a piece of tinsel, and they bring it up, and then they see, oh, something else. We need to make sure that that doesn't happen to our developers. We want to keep them focused and able to do their job. We need strong communication uh, across our working unit, across the company, with the client. Who here knows why uh, manhole covers uh, are generally round and heavy. Anybody? Manhole covers in the road? So the, yeah. It can, it can move and fall into the, uh, into, the, into the hole, right. And they're heavy because, exactly, you can't lift them up. 
So I like to think of project managers as being manhole covers. We keep people from falling down holes and getting hurt. It behooves us to use clear communication to prevent ourselves or clients or colleagues from falling down into dangerous places. And 90% of what we do is that communication. It's not just communicating out. It's setting up a space and a framework that allows us, uh, our teams to most effectively communicate with each other. And it's listening. It's listening for underlying messages. It's listening for unspoken messages. Because often when our clients say something, we may hear something, and what they mean is something completely different. So we listen to the unspoken message. And we're not going to talk a whole lot about tools in this, uh, in this chat, because the tools are just there to help us get to a point where the message, the communication, is being facilitated well. If you want to talk about tools, I'll be doing a, a boff after this where we can, where we can, uh, where we can geek out on, uh, on Jira and stuff like that. So over the last 20 years, I've used um, three different methodologies, and we're going to talk about all three of them. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the lessons that I've learned from, from each of them and how um, they sort of all munged into a, a process that has generally worked well for a bunch of different shops that I've been in, in, involved with. The first is Cowboy. Cowboy can be extremely unpredictable. Does everybody know what Cowboy is? Raise your hand if you do. Yeah? Okay. So basically the idea of Cowboy is that you're iterating incredibly quickly. Uh, your iterations can be like one day. And it's, because of that, it's very fast in terms of development, but it requires that there's a ton of uh, trust that needs to exist between developers and stakeholders. And it can lead to a miscommunication of expectations. It works really well if you're bootstrapping a, a, a new product. It also works really well if uh, if you've got screwy requirements that uh, that you that you that you can't uh, that you can't get your arms around really, uh, and that uh, it, in situations where you need to to build quickly, it's highly informal, um, and it focuses on stakeholders. It can be used uh, in very unpredictable products uh, projects rather. And it's great for prototyping. Strangely enough. This is the methodology that uh, we used at Examiner when I worked at Examiner to get Examiner out the door. Why would we do that with a giant, uh, with a giant site uh, that ended up uh, having 7 million nodes being migrated across multiple uh, media types, 200,000 users um, in, in one of the most heavily trafficked sites on, on, on the internet? Well, the reason was this. Um, I, when I was hired, uh, I, uh, I went into the office and uh, they handed me the requirements. And I kid you not, I had seven binders, like this, this big, seven binders. And I started going through it, and it was clear to me that nobody um, on the team prior to the Drupal, the Drupal team coming on had ever looked at Drupal. They, they were the most undrupal uh, requirements that I'd ever come across. That's okay. I mean, we can build things. We can pretty much build anything that somebody wants. But what I said was, I need to go away, and I need to, I need to plan this out. So I, I, uh, I, I went away for a couple of weeks, three weeks, something like that, and I Gantt charted the whole thing out because, you know, they give me all these requirements. Waterfall was perfect for this, right? And when I got to the, uh, and, and uh, the, the Gantt chart was roughly the size of that uh, screen up there. It was huge, and it was, it was deep and wide, which meant that we needed lots of people over a relatively short period of time to get the job done. So I went into the uh, boardroom and I said, I got great news. I know exactly how we can, we can make this happen. And it's just going to take us 18 months. And there was silence. Now, keep in mind, nobody had talked to me about time frame or anything like that, really, at that point. And somebody spoke up and said, you got nine months. So at that point, the best thing to do was to pick up those requirements and throw them in the trash. And we started building. And every day, we would sit down with stakeholders, and we would go through what we'd built, and we'd talk about it, and we'd figure it out. And we got it done in nine months, or at least we got the front end of it done in nine months. We were still, we were still using Cold Fusion uh, at the end to do, uh, to do content publishing, but we did get the, the site out the door uh, in that period of time. It was crazy. It was amazing. Um, um, but um, the only way that we could do it was to throw the requirements away and start to, to iterate quickly. Waterfall sacrifices speed for predictability. It's much slower. And it's not great for companies that have some risk tolerance. 
um, because typically companies that have uh, tolerance for risk want to get uh, down to building things quickly. Um, early in my career, almost every project that I worked on uh, was custom PHP MySQL uh, applications, and those were all done using Waterfall because we were planning everything right from the from the from the get go. We had to do everything from figure out what the authentication system was going to be, how we we're going to build that, all the way down to to how uh, how how content was going to be displayed. So for those kinds of projects, like uh, I built a grant-making system uh, that was used across the United States, built an adjudication system for artists to, to, uh, to submit uh, artwork, um, to uh, competitions, that kind of stuff. It was perfect for that kind of, uh, for, for that kind of uh, project. So who here has worked using Waterfall? Almost everybody. Great. Okay. So have any of you ever worked on a project that had a fixed scope, and the scope didn't change. Yeah, no, no hands, right? Right. That's because Waterfall doesn't exist. It's a pipe dream. It's a, it's a myth. Um, so you never can plan for things not changing. Waterfall works great if you're building a dam. It works great if you're designing a car. It's not great for software. Waterfall also often has requirements that are dictated. So remember how I was talking about Examiner a few minutes ago? That big set of binders? How creative do you think that that would have made the, our development team feel? Not creative at all, right? And we're all creative people. We want to we wanna build things that are cool, and we want to do it in ways that, uh, that are, that, that, that are fil fulfilling. And when you're just handed a bunch of requirements, you don't feel that way. You feel like you work at uh, a fast food restaurant at that point. And worst of all, no matter how well you've planned something out, scope will shift in the middle of a, of a set of features. In Waterfall, there can be a tendency for a client to become impatient, and that can lead to missteps. You can develop before you're ready to, uh, to, to develop, and that creates a, a munged up methodology that can feel like you're at the edge of a waterfall and about to go down it. So rather than fight change, I came to the conclusion that you need to embrace it. In Agile, it requires that we weave, that we move, that we're flexible. And there's this thought that with Agile that there's no predictability, that you're not planning, and that's completely not true. But what you are doing is you're setting up uh, a set of expectations within a time box. We'll talk about a time, bo time boxes in just a minute. But the idea is that you set up your expectations in a, in a very distinct um, period of time, and you've got a beginning and an end to that, uh, to that period that's, that's, uh, that's set. Everybody has the same set of expectations. So with Agile, you've got defined time boxes. You work in an iterative ma manner, so you're, you're adding to what you've built the last, the last time box. It's incremental, so you're building things that work. They're ready to, to ship, at the, hopefully, at the end of each sprint. Um, and it's collaborative. The requirements are collaborative, solutions are collaborative, and it, it's relatively rapid and flexible and responsive to change. So it's not as, as crazy as, uh, as Cowboy, but it sure, sure is more flexible than, than Waterfall. And you organize your own teams. So let's talk about terms. First of all, um, I've talked about time box. Um, a time box doesn't refer to a ship that can move through space and time, although I'm guessing many of us would like to be able to develop software that way. Time boxing is a way to contain risk. So the idea is that you put constraints around a period, and then you can better estimate um, what you're going to build during that period of time um, because you're, you're breaking your project up into smaller chunks. So time box defines a period that you can complete a set of tasks. And that includes um, doing your planning at the beginning, doing your development, and also um, uh, going through user acceptance testing with your client. We'll talk a little bit about uh, acceptance testing in a bit. Sprint. A sprint comprises planning which stories from your backlog. Everybody know what stories are? Does anybody not? 
Okay, good. Um, so you're planning which stories uh, you're going you're gonna to work on from your backlog. And typically what I like to do is uh, have two-week periods for developers to, to be developing. I've, I've found that uh, in two weeks you can build working software that, uh, that, uh, that can do things that clients can look at and feel good about and, uh, and, uh, and go through a review process on. So you figure out what you can do in that two weeks of, uh, of development. The other uh, thing that you're doing during your sprint is you're having your developers code, and at the end of it, you're having your stakeholders test. You're fixing bugs during that period of time. Epics. So an epic is sort of like a really big story. It might be a blog or an article or something like that. It's a set of tasks that are going to arc over perhaps um, two or more sprints, and uh, and uh, um, we use epics at Atten as a way to um, a de generally define a project. So when a, when a, when our salespeople are out um, defining what a contract is going to look like, they use epics to define a, a, a set of uh, of, uh, of features. But we also use them when we get into into time tracking. We'll we'll book our time against epics, not against individual tickets. So I've got a good sense uh, as we're going through a project of how long it's taking us to do things, specific kinds of things. But it's not getting so granular that uh, that the development team is going, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I've got to put time on every single individual ticket. User stories are a way to define experiences. So you might have um, something like, as an anonymous user, I want to log on to the site so I can post to a user forum, things like that. And what I'll do is I'll start to go through uh, um, uh, the wireframes that our user UX people have put to, together, and I'll start to put user stories together for each and every element that I think I might want a client to, uh, to test against. And I write them in such a way that it's really easy for the client to understand what it is that we're uh, what it is that we're uh, we're going to we're going to build, and it becomes a collaborative effort between the client and myself as we go through and uh, and uh, and write stories. And it's really common, actually, by the end of uh, story writing, for the client to be writing most of the stories at the very end. They've learned the syntax. They know uh, they know uh, how to go through it and. Uh, um, we'll, we'll, also, we'll also make use of those stories. Uh, we'll do it with Behat, so we can use those as, uh, uh, for, for testing uh, at the end as well. So then we also use a thing called Scrum. Uh, Scrum is basically a 15-minute uh, meeting every day. Um, I ask, what did you do in the last 24 hours? What are you going to do today? And what are your blockers? Um, and uh, if there are blockers that uh, that uh, that need to be uh, that need to be dealt with, what we'll do is we'll ask people to find the appropriate individual that can help them unblock those blockers. We don't want to discuss those during the, the the actual Scrum meeting. If the Scrum meeting lasts more than 15 minutes, we're doing something wrong. We also engage in client check-ins. I do them at least once a week, um, and this is kind of my Scrum with the with the client. Um, they can last from anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour. But we also allow all of uh, our developers um, to have access to the client and vice versa. So clients can uh, can uh, come in and they can say, hey, um, I really need to discuss X, X Y, Z, and uh, um, uh, we allow for that kind of interaction. So let's talk about roles now that we've talked a little bit about the terms that, uh, that uh, we engage in in, uh, in, in uh, Agile. Um, if teams aren't flat, they can make mistakes. So it's really important that everybody's equal, that everybody has a say, that everybody's able to, uh, to, to communicate in a, in, a, in a safe place. The first uh, uh, individual is the project manager. We use uh, our project managers also as scrum masters. So they're the ones that uh, run the, little, the, the, the meetings and so forth. They uh, are the ones that lead um, our, our estimation process. Uh, that includes all of our developers, and uh, we use the Fibonacci sequence for our, for our, uh, for our uh, um, estimating. Um, they act as a defense against distractions. So if, uh, for example, my boss comes in and says, I really need so-and-so to work on such-and-such on, uh, on -such instead of the project that they're working on, um, I'll say, well, here, here, here are the implications. We won't get this done for this client. Is that really what you want us to be doing? 
Um, and uh, we help uh, the team avoid mistakes, and we manage the schedule. So we figure out when the, when the, uh, when the sprints are going to happen um, and uh, work with uh, developers to figure out what, what are going to be in those sprints. We mix up our product and UX people a little bit. Um, typically in, uh, in uh, Scrum, in Agile, you've got a product owner, and the product owner owns the, uh, the backlog. Um, our product owners are also our user experience people. Um, they act as a communication conduit between business and development groups, and uh, they help develop stories uh, as well, in advance, well in advance of sprints. Um, they're responsible for the backlog, for personas, epics, and stories. They clarify business needs, and they do demonstrations at the, uh, at the end of a sprint. So it's demonstra demonstrations we'll talk about in a little bit, but they're really important to the process. Our developers self-organize stories, and uh, they communicate expectations of what can com be completed in a sprint and what can't be. So if I try to stuff too much stuff into, uh, into, a, into a sprint, I want them to feel safe to be able to say, Matthew, we can't, we can't do all of that in this, in this particular chunk of time. Um, that's really important because, uh, again, you don't want to have missed expectations. And then the, uh, the developers also define how business needs should be architected and executed. So I'm not going to tell uh, my development team uh, how to do their job. They're the, best, they're the best able to know the best technologies to, to, to make use of in order to get a, uh, get, a, get a task completed in the most efficient way. And then it's their job to execute. Um, and because they've been so involved in the process, if they don't execute, then during our retrospective, when we're talking at the end, we discuss what went wrong. How can we make this better? So we use uh, that those are roles. And what I want to talk a little bit now is information architecture, user experience, and stories, and how we use those artifacts to set up projects for success. So we uh, uh, do a thing called a content audit at the beginning of, uh, of every project. So we'll go through and we'll look at a, an, existing, uh, an existing site and we'll say, okay, what content's there? Hey, hey client, what content uh, should we keep? What content are you missing? What content can go away? All that's really important because uh, at some point or another, you're almost certainly going to be doing a migration. And uh, it's best if you don't bother migrating content that, uh, that just needs to go away. We'll also build these things called content maps. It's a text way to review what the architecture will look like that's easily consumable uh, by non-technical people. So we'll, we'll uh, define what each one of the uh, page types is going to look like, but we'll write down what's going to be on that page. And we do it um, in hierarchy, so the most important stuff in that document is at the top of each of, each of those descriptions. The idea is that these need to be really quick to build, and we can throw them away when we're done with them. Then we'll go in and we'll do a sitemap. Um, we don't do uh, sitemaps like org charts. Um, what we found is that uh, when you do an org chart style sitemap, you end up having to define all those little boxes anyway, so you end up with a document. So it seemed like a waste of time. So again, we do our sitemaps as, uh, as text in Google Docs. We do our wireframes in a, in a uh, piece of software called Axure, which I'll show, uh, I'll show a screenshot of in a little bit. But Axure allows us to build uh, working prototypes um, where you can click on links and you can go to pages and you can use menus. And it gives, a, it gives the client a real sense of flow through the site um, uh, prior to ever, or, or ever having to uh, uh, write a line of code. Um, like I said earlier, we write our user stories um, collaboratively. And then we build uh, a Drupal architecture. So we define all the fields, taxonomies, um, content types, all the, the view modes, all those kinds of things um, up front. And then we use uh, a, uh, a module called Sync. You want to write this down. Sync. Um, what Sync allows you to do is have your information architects use a predefined um, uh, spreadsheet. And once they defined all of the fields with the client, all we need to do is press a button, and all of our content types, vocabularies, they're all built. So within minutes of us uh, getting sign off on the, uh, on the Drupal architecture, I can have a client in a working Drupal site um, testing 
looking at the content types, starting to get a sense of, uh, of whether we've gotten things right or wrong. Um, sync is great. All right, design. So our design process is a little bit different than, uh, than lots of different uh, groups. We don't design at each and every page um, in, a, in a site. We'll design just a few key pages. And what we do is we start with a design studio, what we call the design studio. And really what that means is we sit down with the client and we go through a series of sketching exercises. So a big part of that is to, to start getting um, our, our client partner used to collaborating with us. So we're drawing things together, we're working together, and usually those, those uh, artifacts that come out of that exercise don't really get used for much, but it definitely starts that, that, uh, that mentality that we're gonna be working together and we expect you to, to interact. We, uh, the process that we work in, if we don't have client, uh, client buy-in and interaction, it just doesn't work. That moves on to what uh, are uh, uh, mood boards or element collages. Um, an element collage is, uh, is an artifact which has like, what is the header gonna look like? What is the footer gonna look like? What are our button styles? Uh, what will a block quote look like? What do our H1s, 2s, 3s, 4s look like? Um, and it uh, deconstructs it from, uh, from uh, uh, individual pages. And the idea is that ultimately, our, our uh, themers can use that as a template to look at, to, to see how things should, uh, should look. And it also allows the client to, to do the same thing and reduces the amount of design that we need to do um, up front. We'll then go in and we'll do two or three mock-ups, um, sometimes four. Um, and, uh, and from all of that, we're able to, we're able to uh, define the rest of, uh, rest of the site. So once all of that's done, we've gone through information architecture, we've gone through design, then we get into our sprints. So we're going to assume a 20-day 20, a 20 sprint, a four-week sprint for this. Um, and uh, I, I talked earlier about how we do two-week development periods. Um, those, those overlap, so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So the breakdown of that is one week of planning and organizing, two weeks of development, and one week of user acceptance. Uh, and uh, usually at the beginning of a process with a client, I will sit down and I'll do user, uh, user acceptance with the client. So I'll go through and I'll say, okay, let's take a look at the first story. Here's the, here's the path to success. So I'll write down the victory state. I'll go through and I'll indicate exactly how to test with links and, uh, and so forth. And uh, it makes it super easy for the, for the client at the end to say, yep, that, that does what we said that it was gonna do. And if you've broken down your stories into small enough chunks, what you'll find is that, uh, that uh, user acceptance comes very quickly. And as people get used to accepting, they accept more and faster. Um, so if you give a client a big page and say, what do you think? You're gonna get uh, stuck on all kinds of tiny little de details which really aren't important they are important, but they're not important in terms of, of, uh, of getting, getting a, uh, a product to, to, uh, to uh, uh, ship. Um, so it's really important to get yourself to a place where you can, you can uh, get acceptance on lots of things very quickly. We work in small teams, typically a team lead, a developer, who's also a developer, uh, a back-end developer, and a front-end developer. Sometimes we'll float in a, another, another individual, another developer who does things like uh, uh, migrations and so forth, but typically we work in three-person teams. And each team works on two projects. So when I talked about, uh, about uh, uh, planning and uh, UAT, those are slightly downtimes for our development team, and we want them to be actively producing stuff. So if you look up, uh, up at that slide there, you'll see that for project one, week one is, is planning, week two is development, week three is development, week four is UAT. The second project that they're working on, they'll be engaged in development on project two, UA, uh, for, in week one, um, I'll be doing UAT with the client during week two. Then we'll go into project planning week three. And then we'll go into development, uh, the first week of development in week four. So for our development team, it becomes sort of this rhythm where they're going back and forth between projects and we're able to, we're able to keep their, their development velocity high 
We want their we want them to, to be uh, uh, billing billing pretty much all of their time, um, and it allows the client enough time that they can breathe, they can help plan, and they've got time to do uh, acceptance testing. On the last day of, uh, of any time box, we'll do a company-wide demonstration. Demonstrations are really important because it allows your entire company to know what's being built. It builds respect across your teams. And hopefully, at the end of it, everybody knows how to use the prod products that you've been building or if not, uh, at least who they can talk to. So if somebody picks up the telephone and uh, they're, they're, uh, they get a, we get a call from uh, client A, they know which team's been working on that particular project and, uh, and uh, they in general know how it, how it works. We want all, everybody to, to, uh, to feel up to speed on that. Directly after our demonstrations, it's really important to have a retrospective. A retrospective is a meeting where the team um, uh, gets together, it's in a safe place, it's relatively private, and we are brutally honest with each other about what worked, what didn't work, and how we can make things better. So our entire agile practice is agile itself. We iterate every single, every single uh, um, uh, sprint that we engage in, and we learn from every single sprint, and we make slight tweaks, little tweaks as we're, as we're moving along. Team members uh, have their feedback and suggestions heard, which is really important. People like to be heard. They like to know that, uh, that their opinions matter. And then project managers are accountable uh, to fix any, any issues that have come up that we've discussed and that they're being addressed from time box to time box. So everybody keeps everybody honest in this process. Okay. I said that I wasn't going to talk very much about tools, but I'm going to talk a little about them. Um, first of all, uh, does everybody use something like Slack or IRC or Skype or, or HipChat in your in your uh, in your shops? Yeah. Um, and how many of uh, how many of you are virtual companies, and how many of you are? Let's start with virtual companies. How many of you? And how many of you are are uh, are have bricks and mortar, or in a building? Yeah. So. I really like channels, log channels, because it means that me as a project manager, I can go back and I can see what uh, my team has been talking about, where the problems are. I can scan them. So for example, I'm in mountain time. Um, I'm eight hours off of my team right now. Um, but I can go back uh, and take a look at the end of each day. What is it that they've been working on? And uh, what were the questions? That's really really useful. It's, it's terrific. We're using Slack now. When I did this slide originally, we were just using IRC, uh, we were using, uh, IRC and, uh, and HipChat mostly. Um, and I like, personally, I like to separate out client communication when they want to have chats into something like Skype, something completely separate from what the team uses. Again, that, this goes back to how can I minimize distractions? Um, uh, I also want to have a tool that I can shut off so if I need to, to, uh, to just be concentrating on my, my team, I can completely separate those, uh, those elements out. We use Google Docs a ton. We use them for documentation. We use them for collaboration with our clients. Um, I use, I, I'll, uh, I'll, take, uh, I'll take my ticket queue in JIRA and I'll export it into, into, uh, uh, into a CSV and pull it into a Google Doc where everybody can, can work together. Um, in this case, um, we're using, in this case, the, this Google Docs is being used to track stories. So you can see that there's a, uh, a ticket number there, there's the story, uh, there's the description, there's status, there's uh, QA feedback uh, in there, uh, and, and so forth. And we use color coding to say, okay, this is done, this isn't done, um, this is, uh, and for red, this is a blocker, this is a problem. We also use JIRA for our internal ticketing. Um, how many of you use a ticketing system? Does everybody use ticketing? Good. All right. Um, how many of you use JIRA? Cool. So I've used lots of different ticketing systems. I've used JIRA. I've used, uh, I've used uh, Chili Project. I've used Track. I've used a ton of them. I think JIRA is the best of, uh, of them. Um, 
although I don't think anybody really likes their ticketing system that much. But it, 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 Jira, Jira, I think, is, is the best of the, the ones that I've worked with. Yeah? Um, is there Trello? Sure, yeah, yeah. And similar to Trello, you can see that we've got, we've got uh, swim lanes. We drag cards from, from swim, lane, swim lane to swim lane. Um, what you can see in this particular slide is that we've got our user stories in there, and then I task my developers to to uh, self-organize those stories and write their own their own uh, their own uh, subtasks. So at any given time, I can look at this uh, at this uh, Kanban style board, and I can see exactly what the state is of every ticket that's in a that's in a given sprint. Um, and uh, you can collapse. You can collapse up um, um, the uh, the the, uh, the subtasks you want, or you can expand them. There are all sorts of different filters that you can use to to uh, effectively effectively um, just filter by yourself or by other people and so forth. Um, um, but uh, it, uh, it's a highly effective way for me to be able to, to see what's going on. And they go through a general workflow of to do, in progress, internal review, code review, client review, and done. Um, once tasks are moved to client review, I point our client at Basecamp. We're, we're actually starting to sh shift to Service Desk, in, uh, which is another Atlassian pro product. But currently what we do is we have all of our stories in Basecamp. And um, then uh, the, the stories get moved from a draft state into user acceptance when we're ready to go through the user acceptance process. And I, like I said earlier, I, I'll, I'll write up the... Uh, the uh, uh, the path to success for each one of those uh, one of those stories. Um, I, I list the story and I also put the Jira ticket number just to make it easy for me to go back and forth. Um, again, this allows us to break things down into bite-sized chunks, and it makes it super easy for a client to know exactly what we're working on when they're when we're working on it, and uh, it again helps with that collaborative uh, process that we go through. We use Axure, like I said, for our wireframing. Axure is quick and interactive. Uh, my information architects can build out a, uh, an Axure prototype very, very quickly, um, often in, uh, in, a, in a day or less. And uh, again, because they're so quick, we don't feel bad about throwing them away if there's something wrong. We want all of these artifacts to be pretty, pretty much disposable. And then finally, we use Harvest to book our, our time uh, against. Uh, and that, the big reason for that is uh, that there's a plugin that you can use in Jira that allows us to, to uh, uh, very easily track against Harvest. And our, our uh, accounting uh, folks um, like Harvest better than, uh, than some, some of the other tools that we've uh, used in the past. So Harvest is a great way for people to be able to track their time. So it doesn't really matter what ticketing system you use, but uh, we've done, I've done ticketing in Basecamp, Track. Uh, I've done it uh, using Jira, uh, Chili Project. Um, uh, and uh, I, like I said, I, I, like, uh, I like Jira the best. Uh, we use, uh, we use, uh, typically use Basecamp for client communication these days. And uh, if you're not using something like GitHub or, uh, or Bitbucket uh, for version control, you really should be. And then we'll use things like uh, like uh, ScreenFlow or y Jing for, uh, for for screen captures um, that we can apply to tickets. Um, and uh, we use Google Hangouts, Join Me, that kind of stuff uh, for for client communication. Most le most recently, I started using a tool called um, uh, what was it? I can't remember. It's a, it's a it's a uh, it's a telephone telephone uh, conferencing system. Oh yeah, it's called Uber Conference. Um, and I, I, I don't think it's available here. It's probably just available in the United States and Canada. Um, and then again, we use, uh, we use uh, channels that we can log. Um, so uh, we're able to go back and take a look at what people have uh, worked on. So we're going to go back to the first slide. Uh, just to remind you, a number of commercial flights were crashing in the 90s. And uh, they couldn't figure out... Uh, what was going on? There wasn't equipment malfunctions. There weren't tornadoes going on. Icing wasn't happening on wings. Nobody could really figure out what was going on. Does anybody have an idea why those flights were falling out of the sky? No? No, it wasn't computers. There was, no, there was nothing going wrong with the planes. The black boxes were clear. Yeah?
Mm -hmm. Right. It was a process issue. You're absolutely right. So there was the, the problem. The problem was that uh, uh, communications were being constrained by rules of hierarchy. First officers and engineers um, didn't feel like they could uh, uh, that they could uh, speak directly to the captain about their concerns. And planes were going down because people who had expertise weren't speaking up. So the strength of an agile process is that you make everything flat. Everybody has, uh, has their area of expertise. There isn't hierarchy. We keep each other honest. We keep each other doing, doing the jobs that we're supposed to do. It's much easier to identify risks and un unblock problems when feedback is built into the entire system via scrums, war rooms, retrospectives. And you want to set up a culture where you eliminate blame. People can own their mistakes. People ask for feedback. And everybody listens to each other. And if you're able to do all of that, then what you're going to end up with is a, is a situation where you can deliver working code more quickly. We aren't overburdened by specific requirements, but we focus on business needs that bring value to the clients. And, uh, and we trust that the Scrum teams will deliver those products that meet, uh, meet the needs of our clients. And that will put you in a position where you can get things done faster, better, and more awesome. So thanks very much. Um, I'll take, uh, I'll take questions if people have questions, and if you could evaluate the session, that would be great. If you could use the microphone, that would be great, because they're recording this. Um. Uh, this question has to do with um, your sprint timing. Yeah. Um, so we do two-week sprints, but we're never sure whether you have sprints back-to-back -back or do you kind of have a week in between sprints so that mm -hmm. you can do a proper evaluation after and then plan for the next sprint. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you guys do? So that's the reason that we do two projects at a time. Um, we, uh, we have a week of planning, two weeks of, uh, of development, and a week of user acceptance testing, but they overlap. So while, while, uh, while user acceptance is going on and planning is going on on the other project, um, our developers are developing in the, uh, in the, in the first project. Um, that, that gives us an, enough, uh, enough uh, 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 runway, so to speak, to be able to keep them bill, billable um, and keep them busy. Um, but also gives uh, clients uh, enough time that they can breathe and that they can feel like they've got uh, adequate time to be able to go through the process of planning with us and go through the process of, uh, of acceptance testing. Right. Um, does that make it difficult for developers to constantly switch on, switch off? From project to project? No, because it's two weeks, right? It's not. It's not like it's not like it's a, a day on this project and a day on that project. Right. Um, two weeks is is plenty time, plenty of enough time to to really dig into into functionality and uh, and deliver something that can be shipped. Um, there are some projects that we work on where we have a higher velocity. Like I'm working on a project right now for a for a, uh, um, a largish reproductive rights uh, organization that um, that uh, um, we're we're actually treating them as if they're two different clients. So our development team is actually sprinting constantly on this one project, but we're still sticking to the to to the uh, to the 20 day. Um, the 20 day sprint schedule and making sure that there's enough time for, for, for the, that particular client to be able to test and, uh, and be able to plan with us. Okay, thank you. Yep. Hello. Hi. I have a question about the product owner role in your projects. Yeah. Um, the product owner, uh, do you use that role and is it someone from the client side and is he on site? So we mix up. That's one place where our, our process has sort of um, gone sideways um, compared to a lot of agile uh, agile uh, shops. Our, our typically our product owner internally is the uh, is the person who's done the information architecture. Um, and the reason that we do that is because that person has had the most conversation about what the product is going to look like at the end with the client. But the client also is involved in product ownership. But I don't want, I don't want the client owning the backlog. 
Um, I want I want them to be involved in the backlog, but I want somebody on my team to to own the backlog. So that's the reason that we use the information architect for that. But the user acceptance test is uh, done by by the client. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. so the user acceptance tests. Uh, are based on the user stories that we've written at the beginning. So if we're able to if we're able to uh, reach a victory state on uh, a user story, uh, and the client can test it, then we then we know that we've completed that particular that particular set of tasks. Um, and uh, what I'll typically do is I'll put the I'll put the steps to get to the victory state on the ticket that's been assigned to the client with that user story. So they've been involved in, in helping write them at the beginning. They know what, uh, they know what the, uh, what the uh, uh, requirements have been that, uh, that we've collective, uh, collaboratively developed, and then they get steps in order to, to, uh, to complete that testing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I'm curious about some tweaks to the schedule involving hot fixing and uh, rapid development. If you've got a, a one-month sprint schedule and they're not happy with what they got once it goes live, how do, how's that handled? Sure. So once a, once a product at Atten goes live, um, we, shift, we shift teams, actually. So I, I manage uh, project teams, and we also have what's called consulting. And they are, are teams that are specifically involved in, in, uh, in helping maintain uh, maintain a, a, a product after it's shipped, um, and uh, and so those teams are incredibly um, agile, like to the nth degree. And typically, their their engagements are anywhere from twelve to fifty hours uh, a month with a given client, and they're engaged in taking care of things like hot fixes and stuff like that. Hello, hi. Um, have you also experienced uh, Kanban? Instead of Scrum, uh, yeah, I've used Kanban, um, and and I like it. Um, I just like Scrum better. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I like I like uh, I like uh, uh, the the whole the whole uh, uh, business of of uh, connecting with the team once a once a day. I like, and, and we use a Kanban style board like a lot of uh, a lot of agile shops do. But yeah, I've used Kanban in the past. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. I'm going to be doing a, if people want to talk about tools a little bit more deeply, um, I'll be doing a uh, birds of a feather after this session. I'm not sure what rooms, room it's in, but, uh, but it's on the, uh, on the uh, BOF schedule board. Um, and uh, yeah, anybody that wants to sit and talk more, I, I'd love it. Thank you.